All right, guys, we're back with another version of KC Music Talk. My guest today is a instrumentalist around here, around Kansas City, uh, Gerald Trimble. Thank you, Rob. It's Thanks a for coming, man. Well, I know your show. I've enjoyed it, and it's an honor to be asked to be on it. Yeah, well, thanks for coming, man. Um, so I, uh, I'm sure I met you out at one of the Irish jams a bunch of years ago, six years ago or yeah. something. And um, so the first thing is that obviously when people see you in a music setting, the first thing that they kind of gravitate towards is what the heck is this thing what the heck is this thing that's right and tell us what this thing is i, I play unusual instruments and uh i've been doing that all my life uh the the most interesting thing for me is to play instruments that come from the past that i found in great adventures sometimes and had restored and put together uh and to play music that is timeless on those instruments and I brought my favorite one and the one I'm working with now. I know this isn't as much a playing show as an interview show, but it's important to share this instrument. It's, it's probably made in anywhere between 1670 and 1690, probably let's mm -hmm. say 1680, in Modena, Italy. And it was made by a famous Italian maker. Of course, you know the Italian makers are the big, mm -hmm. the big guys. And uh, it was made by a, a maker named Antonio Cassini mm -hmm. in Modena, Italy which is also the home of Ferrari. Mm -hmm. And uh, this instrument looks like a cello or what we call a violoncello because violoncello means little bass. Mm -hmm. And that term referred to a number of instruments that were developed in that period in Northern Italy at that time. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of technical reasons why. But I don't think it was a cello like we know it today. Uh, it came eventually to be turned into that like most of them were. Mm -hmm. But I think it was some form of what we call viola da gamba, which is what I mm -hmm. play. And the word viola da gamba means the fiddle, because you know you play the viola, mm -hmm. but it, it's, a, it's a general word for instruments of that period. It's the fiddle that you play on your knee, gamba. Mm. And most gambas have a different shape. They're a little bit different shape, and they have a flat back. This has a arched back like a, like a violin. Mm -hmm. But even though it was in five strings or four strings, it has a very, very interesting story. And that story is that I looked at this instrument in maybe 2006. It was brought to me and, and made available to me by a very famous dealer and maker in New York named Christophe Landon, Christophe Landon Violins. And it originally, well, originally in this incarnation, it was a five string, a five string cello. And you mm. know that that's becoming more popular. There's interest in that for playing the box suites. Mm. And uh, you don't see a lot of five string cellos, but you do see more. And I wanted to play five string at that time. Uh, and I was offered this. And the thing that's interesting is this instrument was found in Bologna, Italy, sometime probably in the 50s or 60s, by a very famous cellist named Amaryllis Fleming. And Amaryllis Fleming was the sister of Ian Fleming, the James Bond mm -hmm. author. And she was, she was quite a well-known cellist at the time, and she was the first person in modern times to revive the five-string mm. that's called for in the sixth box suite. It's called for a violoncello, a six chord, six chords, six strings, mm. a tune D, G, D, A, E. And I thought, oh, cool, a five-string. Well, at the time, I, I did not buy it, partly for financial reasons, and I, I didn't know enough, uh, so I let it go, and I thought it had been sold. And... I was reading a, a, a thesis by a woman, a woman named Dr. Myrna Herzog, who's a very famous uh, scholar and viola da gamba player in Israel. And she wrote a whole article about violin-shaped viola da gamba. Mm -hmm. So vials that are in the shape of fiddles. Mm -hmm. And all that hybridization is really important because vials are not generally as loud, but the flat back and the old construction, they're very ancient instrument and archaic in some ways i mean they sound great but they don't have the power mm. that a fiddle your right. your viola uh, a violin that's the reason that the violin family took over because they were much more powerful for the mm. concerts that were starting to happen well uh, a couple of things i'm noticing is one what is going on with that okay is that is that 
can, is that hollow? I yeah, mean, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Can I touch it? No, no, no. I mean, like, like that's th that's not just black, right? That that's through to the. Oh no, no, no. It's it's open. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's crazy. I've never seen that before. I don't uh, know if you guys can see that yeah, on the I, video of it, there's you know it's it's got like an emblem kind of looking thing, but there's like holes in it designed holes and that I mean that's crazy yeah this is All very I've cool. usually seen is the F holes or a guitar with the you know the big open hole that's crazy well the, yeah it, it's very beautiful the way this works well first of all uh, it was discovered from this article that uh, uh, a guy named Ben Hebert discovered that there were actually six strings on this instrument uh -huh. the peg box and it's it was short and they've done all kinds of things to these instruments over the years yeah. to make them modern but it was originally had six strings. We don't know if it was called a viola da gamba or just a violoncello with six strings or a uh -huh. bass violin, but it had six strings. And this has frets like a guitar or a lute. They're tied right. on. Is that supposed to be? It's supposed to be for gamba. Wow, this, All they're, spo the they're supposed to have frets? Absolutely, wow. so you play, you know. Yeah, it right, has yeah. frets mm -hmm. and they're tied on like a lute. Right. And uh, they, they aren't up here. Uh, you got your fretless here, but but it is it is uh, frets. That's and what the other it thing I'm noticing is that n that neck looks thin from back to front compared to a cello. Uh, well, right? I a ce mean, cello yes. seems much thicker, and that that seems really flat. I want it thin because you make a lot of chords. So you're still doing chords as well on there too, huh? Absolutely. Like yeah, you, know, wow. you play like. So uh, it's a it's a bowed guitar, it's a fiddle, yeah. it's a horn, it's everything. But uh, and so definitely curved. I'm seeing definitely very a curve, arch arched body. Yeah, this is arch, it's arch so board. exciting to see this. This is the really old style of uh, violin making that goes back to Amanti. The mm -hmm. the deep sweet sound of a high arching. Mm -hmm. You can see it's like a ski a ski slope on the back. Mm -hmm. And what's so and cool? No end pin too, right? No end pin. Yeah. Uh, end pins are really. They're a, a product of the 19th, 20th century. Mm. Nobody I didn't used, know that. No, I can't say nobody. They yeah. they fashioned wooden pins or they set it on a stool. Yeah. But or they, they wore it on a strap. Yeah. yeah. But the end pin is never mm. used in gamba uh, now and very seldom was and uh, is a modern invention, as is the chin rest. Mm -hmm. for the yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so yeah. all the decoration is what makes this amazing, as well as the style. We we were Christoph Landon restored this neck to uh, to the six string and I had pegs made by Andrew Dipper who's in Minneapolis a great restorer uh, that were like the Italian there's been a lot done to this over the years but he made the the neck the tailpiece and the bridge well we discovered that this decoration through ultraviolet we discovered that all but one of uh, the purfling is original that painting's original you can see it on the back all that painting is original under the original varnish, which is intact. This that you asked about is called a rosette. Right. Yeah, and okay. some cellos have them, but and you can find them, but generally that's a feature of a viola da gamba because mm. it came from lutes. Mm, right. And I do not think that that rosette is original, but certainly the whole is. Mm -hmm. And it had something. And you can see compass marks for where they were trying to figure out where it would be. I think a lot of people uh, thinking back and we were reminded that we've had voice since dawn of time. Yeah. Right. We've definitely had drums for a really long time. Yeah. You know, uh, I remember uh, thinking about that. I'm sure we've had flutes for a very long time uh, or recorder type, you know, type instruments. I, I definitely know that we've, I mean, they were talking about, uh, um, horn kind of instruments with no pads for a very long time too with the with the uh what's the harmonic series and stuff right and then i think a lot of us forget that i mean these violins were 1700s right but there was a whole bunch of stuff right before then right is kind of your wheelhouse of understanding what was the you know the vial into this into yeah. the viola de, and, yeah. and and a lot of times we forget about all those instruments that became the the uh, the bastard instruments that never made it you know all of the all of the uh, all of the experimentation that people exactly. probably tried and then all of a sudden you get to the bass or the yeah. you know the the harpsichord before the 
harpsichord was before piano, right? Wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff, you know? We, we just forget about all that stuff of the older instruments. I think, you know, there's a lot of interest growing in it, but the history of how these things came is amazing. Yeah. And, of course, I'm never at a loss of words to talk about Sure. It. But it is true that before we had... Well, the violin seems to have started in the early 16th century mm. in Italy. Mm -hmm. And the story on that is, no one knows for sure, but there's kind of a general consensus that maybe uh, the Niccolo Amati, the first, uh, uh, or Andrea Amati, was the first one to invent the violin. Now mm. that's like those quotes that you put up because oh. no one really knows. Right. But Amati is credited with that in Cremona, Italy which is where it all started. That's where, you know, his pupil Stradivari. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where all the panache of the Italians started. But they really did have something going. Mm -hmm. And the violin is like the most perfect form of instrument. It, it, it has not changed in 500 years in a major way. I mean, we have right. experimentation. Uh, what, um, who's the fiddle guy? Uh, Mark O'Connor said that the other day. He, he was like, this crap hasn't changed in... 400 years or whatever. It's, and it's something it's like, that doesn't, you know, it, it, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And, and, and the reason is that the, the whole thing about what I'm doing is connecting these cultures because virtually all of the music that we play today in the West, whether it's bluegrass, classical, jazz, mm -hmm. Latin, Celtic, all of it was influenced to a percentage you can't even gauge by the culture of Moorish Spain, um, the Moors or the Arabs or the Muslims mm -hmm. ruled Spain in the south called Andalusia for 700 years and it was a high, high culture. If you want to know what it looked like, go to the plaza because the plaza is built on Sevilla, mm -hmm. our sister city, Sevilla, which is Moorish Spain. Mm -hmm. and that's what it looked like. And imagine a world that allowed Christians, Muslims, Jews, everybody to live together because they were the advanced guys there and the Europeans were, you know, throwing bones to the dogs and living in castles with, uh, were in furs, you know. Well, it was those people that were the highest and the Jews and Christians and Muslims all lived together in, in some, some form of peace for this long and were able to develop a culture that distilled all the knowledge of the ancient world. You, you couldn't learn Greek works if you didn't speak Arabic at that time. You had to go through that culture. The numbers of mathematics created the cathedrals, and that same uh, mathematical proportion created these instruments. These are perfectly proportioned instruments that are built on what's called a sacred geometry. Uh, that means that the proportion they have reflects the number of concepts of the universe, that everything in the universe is based on a vibration and a mathematical principle which is expressed in architecture and in music. It's a fantastic mm. alchemical design. Yeah, it's very deep concept. It, it yeah. really is. Mm. And, and they all came from that. And there were instruments before this, they called viols and medieval fiddles and, and viola da gamba, which developed in the late 1400s mm. by the Moors in Spain from a combination of the early guitars and lutes and a Moorish bowed instrument called a rabab. And you may mm. notice when I bow, I don't bow like this. Right, yeah, I was gonna talk about that and look at, and everybody see how this has got a convex deal yeah. going on. It's right? a, it's it's an outward curve, and right. this is an original so bow. Is that kind, and so I've never played on one of those before, but that's gotta be harder to do spiccato, correct? Am I correct on that? I don't know. It's harder to that, do that. That's what I've heard is that the, the whole purpose, the whole purpose of them concaving it was so that it had this really nice balance. Am I, am I wrong about that? I, I've got to say, when I don't know something, I don't know. Sure, it. And yeah. I'll tell you this, I don't know because I've never played like that. Right. I play like this and I developed it because I started bowing, playing a Kemanche or a, a, a a Turkish and Azerbaijani instrument mm -hmm. before I played this. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned to bow like this. Right, sure. It, so I don't know. I do know that I can do all the... It's out of tune. But sure, yeah. I can do all the, the chops. Mm -hmm. I just figured... I mean, I don't know anybody else who does it with sure. a rope bow, but you can do all that. So sure. I think probably 
Some people would say there's more articulation you can do, but mm. you just have to know how. Sure. This has a clip-in frog. There's no screw mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's just a simple bow, and it's yeah, made out wow. of snake wood. And I just had it rehaired and repaired by Kim, Kim Kruitz from KC Strings. Yeah. Plug for KC Strings. Yeah, yeah. Our wonderful local resource. Mm -hmm. um, and the other night we were in the studio and starting a, a tune, and just as we just got into it, the band... This thing blew out yeah, because know. the humidity was so sure. you know in the rain. Yeah. So I had to have it redone. Thanks, yeah. Kim. But it's amazing. Yeah. You might want to. Yeah, I was thinking crazy. I wanted to see you play that on your viola. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I'd I'd want to hold it like that. <laughs> well, that's all but, right. Uh, but, uh, that's I know the basses always talk about the. Is this French? I can't. I can no. never remember. This is German. That's German. This is German, and that's, and that's the French. French. Okay, I always get them mixed up. And 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 but, uh, the, 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 but that's the other argue, That's the other thing that has been a a big change historically, right? Because definitely right around. It sounds like from what I understand, right around that uh, classical era, seventeen hundreds, they all of a sudden got that new technology. I don't know a whole lot about this stuff, so Actually, I may be wrong. You know, but gradually and early. It was gradually. Okay. And it changed all the time. Right, yeah. So, um, but all of that is fascinating, you know, about why they why they had this, yeah. why they moved yeah. to that, why some bass players are doing the, this instead of this, and all, all that kind of stuff is just really, really interesting. I think French grip is for bass play. Remember, the bass is a viola de gamba and not a violin yeah, originally. Yeah. It came from the gamba family. Mm. It was called the violone. Mm. And that's why we call this the violoncello. It's little violone, mm. little bass. And our bass player, Rick Diamond in Jamboree, he plays German style, yeah. which I really love. And uh, you don't see as many people, but I think it's amazing. And you're pushing down on this hair right here, aren't you? Yeah, I, at different times. I have a little. If you watch Jordi Saval or the you know the big viola da gamba players, they play. They hold it like a pencil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use two fingers to support it because I'm kicking it. I'm, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And most gamba players don't play very hard. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm kicking this thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I have some injuries to my hand and a little bit of arthritis for years, just sure. from repetitive stress. And I I'm okay, but I found a way not to press with my thumb. If you'll see when I'm playing, my thumb is just like that. Yeah. And I nice. actually grip it here, almost like chopsticks. Yeah, sure. So I have a little bit different, and because, and I do techniques that aren't generally connected with Baroque playing. You know, I do, I do as I said, the chop. And our downstroke is, you know, your upstroke, so it's. Yeah, right. And I, I, I listen to. Yeah, Vic, Vic, Victor was talking to me about that a little bit with the upstroke and downstroke. How it's totally backwards and from what we're used to, and you know that's that's how you discovered yeah. your program with Victor sure. being on here. Yeah. Somehow it came up on my. But thing. he was but he was talking to me about the the upstroke and downstroke and how it's just a different feeling on when when you're when you're bowing like that. It's so different, and I I don't know the other one. I can tell you this. Apparently, the original Boeing was like this, and it seems to be where bow instruments come from. The Arabs, again, the, and I say Arabs, all the people, the Jews, right. the Armenians, all the people in that culture, sure. they played these instruments that they took lutes, and lutes have existed since at least 5,000 years. You know, Wow. At least ancient Mesopotamia. We have oh, wow. Egyptian, we have... Uh, Sumerian. That old. Oh, huh? yeah. oh, yeah. Wow. Sure. Okay. You're talking about the history of music. It, yeah. it seems to go uh, voice, sure. drum, yeah. with the shaman. And then somebody put uh, on the skin, they put a, 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 a frame and put strings to make a harp or a mm. lyre and eventually put a neck on it. Now, the flute is another thing, and they right, go like yeah. thousands yeah, of years. Yeah. But wow, I would not have guessed that long. Oh, I, would, yeah. I would have guessed strings are 1,000 AD on. That's, no. that's what I would have guessed. At you know? least, yeah. least uh, 2,500 BCE. Wow. At least. Wow. And uh, uh, developed in, in amazing ways. But they were all simple instruments. Mm -hmm. And as they grew into the different long-necked lutes that we we see today like Turkish saws and mm -hmm. all the different tam tambour they became more varied mm -hmm. and lutes were always con associated with sacred music mm -hmm. with poetry and recitation and mm -hmm. temple things 
something happened around, and when you said a thousand, around eight hundred, mm-hmm. and after eight hundred, someone put a bow mm-hmm. to a lute, yeah. and we think it happened in Central Asia because the the Arabs went that far all the way to China and got the Central Asians uh, interested in lutes. Mm. Somebody took horsehair and we think it was the Central Asians because they're the horsehair Mongol culture, you know, mm. the, the Genghis Khan. Yeah. Somebody took horsehair and uh, made a bow because they're, you know, it comes from, whoo, yeah, right? Yeah, right, sure. And, uh, and made a bow and made these instruments. So the Central Asians had the first, they call kobus. And they're these amazing skull-shaped instruments that the shamans used to go into the other world. Oh, wow. It's wild. And then it's because eight hundred was right near. Was it? Was that around the Gregorian chant kind of time? Which is all there. There was, according to a lot of scholars. I mean, obviously we don't know, but in the dark yeah. ages in Europe, there was no. There were there were crude harps, but there were no lutes. There was no metered music or rhyming poetry. Yeah, and it yeah. was the Arab minstrels mm. who brought all of that. And they were also the inspiration for what we call the troubadours. Not only their lutes uh, in south of France, not only their lutes and their, their fiddles, but their poetry. And mm. it was always connected. And all this just moved on. The, the, the technology, the ideas, the, the ethos of the, of the traveling musician, and it became our modern music. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you got to add the African grooves that came sure. because the Africans were, were all part of this. Yeah. And they were in Europe much more than we think. So mm. it's just a more connected right. connected world. And I do think m- my idea is that this came because the, the minstrels in Europe wanted to, to, to stand up. You, you mm. can only sit with a bow, really. It's much harder to stand with this. You can do it, but it's harder. Yeah, those guys are lazy. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you know, but they wanted. To, yeah, no, I'm just I know. I, I think that they probably sat more in the Eastern cultures to play the music. But uh, uh, the fiddlers uh, decided. You know, they probably played around the, the cathedrals. You know, where all mm. the life was centered, and they got money and people throwing money. So they wanted mm. to dance around. They Move played around, this. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. It's amazing. So, so with with string players, what is what is something that you notice that Maybe maybe for the viola de gamba, just string players in general. Do you notice uh, some kind of younger players if they have any, any kind of what's the, like typical, what's the word I'm looking for? T- you know, typical things that they struggle with, or have you have you noticed any any newer players for this or any strings in general that? I think not just young players. Now this is coming from a very uh, rarefied view because I am not. Number one, I'm not a teacher. Mm -hmm. I can teach like this. I mean, I have a lot of information I've gathered and experiences, Mm -hmm. and I love to share it. I'll do raps on this, you know, Mm -hmm. as well as playing, and I love to tell the story. But I am not a very good, like, beginner or teach. You do this. The only way people really learn from me is by watching. And what I do, I use my own tuning, my own technique. It's, It's really hard to disseminate that to people who are trying to be in a mainstream music. Mm-hmm. And that is both my problem and I think it's also the problem of music because the one thing that I do think is of, of concern to me and that does bother me is not technical as much as it is in general, a tendency to conform mm-hmm. and to stay with the status quo. Everybody plays a fiddle, it's got four strings, everybody plays a cello, they learn it the same way. They do that. And even our music today, so much of music is just, it, it sounds the same because people are copying what everyone does. Innovation is very, very important. And to do that, you have to think outside the box. Right. And I've probably thought outside the box too much because it can be hard to get accepted. Mm-hmm. Our My music as, as an individual solo artist with the group Jam Baroque and all that, it's hard to pigeonhole. People want to fit in a niche. I want to be classical. I want to be Irish. I want to be all these things. I play blues. Yes, yeah, yeah, and to yeah, do yeah. this, we want to be like the people who do that. Right. And in classical, it's very standardized. I mean, all yeah. our cellos are at a certain size because mm-hmm. Stradivari made it that way. The orchestra wants it. And so people, five string? Why would I play a five string? You know, or how can I play like that? You know, it's... 
it's I don't want to dive out in improv, et cetera, et cetera. Well, et cetera that's a whole yeah. other, yeah, that's, that's the second right. thing. Many yeah. people, not so much in bluegrass, but certainly in Celtic, which was hugely involved with improvisation in the 18th century, mm -hmm. no one improvises today. Yeah. Almost no one. And well, so somebody like, like, let's take Dave Agee, for example, like he'll throw in lots of little, little runs and, and he'll, he'll throw in little turns and so, you know, I mean, so he's improvising, you know, he's not completely doing it like a jazz cat would do it, you know, where he's completely making up his lines. But, but I mean, he's really adding some, uh, ornaments. That's the word I'm looking for. He, you know, so that, you know, I don't know if he's original or whatever, but that is, he's doing it more than I've seen other people at some of the Irish jams. I'll just well, say I'm that. Well, I'm laughing. Deal with it. I've known. You know, he, yeah. No, yeah. Dave. I hope you're listening. Okay, so Dave Agee is uh, my friend since 1980, mm -hmm. and he was one of the early people in the group Talisman, Kansas City's first Irish band. And I've watched him learn Irish music after already being an accomplished musician right. in that field. And he knows his stuff as far as fiddle technique goes. And he's, he's a fine teacher. Yeah. And uh, I can learn from him. Yeah. He says he can't improvise. And when we play together, mm -hmm. he goes, oh, I can't improvise. Well, he mm -hmm. can improvise just fine. Yeah. You hear that, Dave? He's <laughs> good at it because he played enough bluegrass and he's played blues and he can improvise. He does tend to keep very, very careful on tunes, especially teaching and until he really gets going because he wants to get the nuance. He's sure. very strict about that. Yeah. So his desire to create a traditional uh, sound and, and a proper orientation for people to hear uh, sometimes overshadows his ability to do new things. But when he does, it's amazing. Yeah, and sure. He's a very fine example of this. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, you said something about the, the kind of idea of this innovation and creativity you were talking about and the lack of it in, in a lot of music. So I heard this guy talking, and he was talking about this idea of order and chaos in our brain and how our, our brains are set up in the sense of our left hemispheres for order and our right, right hemispheres right, right. for this creative... Uh, unknown chaos kind yeah. of creativity whatever and he was he was kind of arguing that th this is you know pretty philosophical but he was talking about that a lot of times we have people that like you're talking about that aren't very good at the kind of creativeness and they're kind of stuck in their structure and order and rules and all of that and but that can go really badly sometimes like an ex and on a bigger scale like for example, like the Nazis would be an example of that, where they ri the, the society was way too ordered. But he did have a further argument saying that if we have no order, though, everything is just chaos. And then so his argument is on the other side, when, he, when you're talking about chaos being the creativeness or whatever, chaos can also go really, really badly because everything is just all over the place. But if but chaos is also symbolized by like the unknown and creativity and taking a risk. And so it can also go really, really great. And so that's, it was really deep how he was explaining this, but he was talking about that, how in some ways we're pushing everybody. There, there's so many people like in the blues world, for example, that I, I, I can say this, that they're like, no, 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 I don't, I don't care about being myself. I want to be Stevie Ray Vaughan. That's it. There is no, you know, there is no creativity. Right. I want to be that. I want to be Hendrix, you know, and, and that, and I can't fault them for not caring about that, but I understand your point, how frustrating that is because then we, because we have all these new, all of these ideas out there, like these new, these new creative ideas. Well, 49 out of 50 of them are terrible, but one of them changes the entire world. You know what I mean? Like 49 out of 50 new ideas are absolutely horrendous and they don't work. But there's one that uh, that changes the entire world of coming up with a, a bowed string. You know, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if you agree with that, but the, the idea of how much creativity do we have in the world and how much are we forcing people into the order? Um, I get this a lot with musicians, how I fight with them a lot where they want to bring everybody over to this creativity side and they're forget, you know, sometimes I think they accidentally forget that, you know, if we, if we don't have a little bit of order, we all go up in chaos, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's finding like the balance there. Do you have any thoughts on it? What do you think about that? Well, I think you said it really well and, and it's, it's a hard question. I think my experience is 
that let's let's say let's go the farthest to free improvisation. And mm. there are people who are really into that. You know Reverend Dwight Frizzell? Uh uh-uh. uh. BCR. Mm. There's some people you need to have on here. Because mm. they're they're mad. They're wild. They're out there. And believe me. And he uh, had us do a show one time with a, a famous professor of free improvisation. A bunch of us on stage just bloop, 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 and that's lovely for experiment, but people generally aren't going to respond to that. In, in we are still entertainers, mm-hmm. and you know I get faulted for being a good performer and moving around and enjoying it just as much as I do for playing long improvisations. So yeah. you can't win, but but it's important to do both. It's important to be an entertainer in the sense of keeping people interested, but it's also important to have improvisation. And what I find is on that far end. The free improvisation, it's fun for a while, but there's no place to go. I won't start an improvisation without a basic line. It could be, mm. let's take an Irish reel and let's find the chord. I'd love to find chord progressions to jam to. That's the order, right? You're or starting with some riff. sort of order and then move to, yeah. And yeah. that's exactly what our music is, because what we're starting with is the Baroque uh, ground basses and chord progressions mm-hmm. that came from the Renaissance and Baroque that they jammed on then. Mm-hmm. And we've forgotten that those people improvised right. very much so. Even Bach, mm-hmm. the cello suites and the, and, the, and the violin partitas and sonatas, the solo stuff, he jammed that yeah. stuff. He just, it just came out and probably Anna, his wife, is the one who wrote it down. Mm. These people could jam. Cadenzas. And, well, cadenzas. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, that that's was, yeah. the ultimate. This is the part yeah. where the soloist gets to do stuff. Mm. God, I, I love this. So what I believe is that you have to have a framework, mm. but you also have to have Creativity. It's like you have to have a base before you can go out there. A base, B-A-S-E. Right. Uh, it helps to have a base, too. But uh, but, but my improvisation is... I shrugged that one off. And no pun intended. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My improvisation is always based right. on some recognizable form that everyone listening, players and right. audience, can come back to. Right. This way we know what we're doing, and that helps the audience hear what's happening. You know, Miles and those guys, they used to play... Mm. Improvisations to the chord progression, and then later play the tune. Right, so, right. Oh, they're playing that. Right, right. you know. Because weren't and and cadenzas weren't you? Because the ones that I always hear, it's like based on the themes of the song. So you had this arpeggio stuff all through the song, and so you get to the cadenza and you do your arpeggio thing your way. You're jamming right, yeah, on yeah, yeah, very yeah. far out variations, variations yeah. based on your virtuosity, right, right, or an aria for a singer. So that's the balance between the, if, if you're taking the framework of this chaos and order, you have the order of the exactly. kind of framework and then you're using the, the new chaos part exactly. to, yeah. I, I thought that was, I don't know if you find that interesting well, or not, but he, all improvisation he, interesting. I'm an improviser. Yeah. That's what I do. That's why we right. call our band Jam Baroque. Yeah, talk about your band. What you guys got? Well, band? God, you got me an improvisation. <laughs> we could talk all <laughs> night. Um, it is amazing, isn't it? it it's just the, the act of spontaneous creation. It's mm-hmm. just... Uh, with familiar sounds and what you're doing the next time, I, I absolutely love it. I've been an improviser all my life. I played jazz when I was a kid mm-hmm. and uh, always played rock and roll and improvised and was, you know, trying to take hotshot guitar solos mm-hmm. and now and then did. And uh, I, when I played Irish music and got into that Celtic music, really, I didn't improvise as much because I was trying to learn the tune for years, but it became a, a, a mission of mine to create improvised Celtic music. Mm-hmm. And some people, this was years ago, some it, some people were open, some people weren't. Now I play that all the time and I, I've studied it. I know the historical background. I've, I've written articles on it and have presented it uh, at, at festivals. We did a festival in France and our whole thing was imp- Celtic, the improvisation Celtic uh, tradition in Celtic music. Mm-hmm. And I've got a way to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's we could talk about that too. Uh, but but I'm interested in creating an improvised music on these instruments that goes back to the improvisation of the Baroque era, but goes beyond that into all our music. I want to create timeless music. We say our group Jam Baroque is connecting cultures through the ages on rare and historic instruments. Mm-hmm. And, and you guys have all original instruments, right? We have all original say, instruments. Say, say what you got. Okay. What are the... Well, my little fiddle, my viola da gamba, mm-hmm. violoncello, or how about we just call it a violoncello da gamba? Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for that, too. Mm-hmm. There's some scholars who won't like, you know, scholars fight over this stuff. But uh, I'd say I call it that. Why? Because 
we have several really cool instruments in our band. Mm -hmm. Mark Wickersham plays what we call the violoncello de spalla. That mm -hmm. may be the original cello from what they study. So how much bigger is that from this one? It's this is it's that instrument is a little bigger than your viola, forty four centimeters. Okay, yeah, so it's yeah. and big ribs, so it's a baby baby cello. So it's down here though. No, no, Not, no. It, it looks like a child's cello, but they didn't have child's cellos. Yeah. Children didn't learn on small instruments then. They learned on Mozart learned on his dad's fiddle. Yeah, yeah. little Mozart and. Uh, <laughs> how'd you like to be Mozart's neighbor kid where the you know and the He's mother like screw this <laughs> Mozart would have done it in five yeah, minutes yeah, yeah, right. but uh, but but uh, the uh, the the violoncello de Spala has been some people say that's what Bach played for mm -hmm. the sweets and a guy named Dmitry Badirov who's the first guy to start making them now he he can show you how they where he recorded all the sweets on there mm -hmm. but uh Mark had one, and uh, I just happened to have two originals. I found them in different in my adventures. Mm -hmm. and I found one in uh, Rome from a famous maker called Claude Lebet, and uh, I got that. It was a French instrument. And then I found another one in Paris at a, a kind of well-known shop in Paris, Le Canu, and I said, like, I gotta have that, you know. And, mm -hmm. and they were both put on modern. Well, yeah, they had modern necks. And were made into a child's cello, even a little impin. Mm -hmm. wow. But we took them and uh, restored them. I kept the 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 one, the first one, in a four string because I didn't want to destroy the scroll. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one had did not have the original scroll, and I put it in Mark's hands. He plays them amazing. You actually put a scarf around your neck and hold it, so you're here like this, and you're playing like that. Weird. Yeah, look it up on uh, on uh, the internet. Violoncello de Spalla, D A S P A L L A. It means shoulder. Yeah. And uh, what else? So his and then he had it made into a five, or we had it made into a five string. Uh -huh. So he's got this amazing instrument. So he's got violoncello de Spalla. Uh -huh. So that's why I call this violoncello de gamba. Uh -huh. Shoulder, knee. Yeah. Then uh, our wonderful fiddler Ali Ryan, she has what has become a fiddle. But it's a, it's the size of a fiddle, but it's actually a little baby viola de gamba. It's called a canton, because it had five strings originally. Five string fiddle, shaped like a fiddle, but with sloping shoulders like a bob. Okay. Yeah. That was popular for about 50 years in the 18th century in France. Mm -hmm. Why? Because ladies were considered rude if they were to play a fiddle. And that, you know, the French, they have their manners. Ladies couldn't play like that, it was rude. But it's okay to play like this. And so they played these little vials. I know, I know, it's crazy, yeah? On their, <laughs> on, you know, it would sit on the skirt. And, and men played it too. And these were, they were called pas de sous de viol. It means the high viola de gamba. Mm. And they played fiddle parts and fiddle tunes on that. Mm -hmm. and, and violin compositions. Yeah. But the one I have that I found in another place in Paris was original. And it was made... That's really interesting. All these instruments were made by near the same people. The first one I had on the shoulder uh, was made by a man named Gerson, who's a very famous French maker. The instrument that Mark has, it has a label in it that says Petrus Fontenu, mm -hmm. who's nobody ever heard of. There's no record of him, but the label is not fake. And what would be the point of faking an instrument like that? You're not gonna make any money off of that. So we figured out that he was a nobleman, he existed. And apparently this guy Gerson, gave lessons to noblemen who wanted to make instruments. Mm -hmm. And this guy made his instrument for himself. And wow. we have that. So that's cool. That's the five string. And that was made in 1751, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then wow. the other one's like 1754. And it was converted to a regular violin, four strings. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a, we would call it a, a canton de violon. So it's like a fiddle, but it's shaped like a little differently. Sure. And then our bass player, Rick Diamond, he doesn't have a... a 17th or 18th century instrument, but he has a 1940s instrument. Amazing bass. It's by K, the company in Chicago, and they mm -hmm. call it a plywood bass, but I'll tell you, it sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a five string, which you do not see. Really. Yeah, wow. Well. And it's a five string called a, a, a Chubby Jackson special. And Chubby Jackson was uh, Woody Herman's bass player. Mm -hmm. And he got this instrument from his dad. This is his mm -hmm. dad's instrument. Yeah, so that's cool. With these marvelous three yeah. instruments mixed with percussion. Uh, Serdar Tungton, our, our percussionist, and Clark Jameson, they play tabla, 
Persian Zar, Dumbek. So we got like this battery of drums, and then we got these three string instruments. Okay, so here's the question. So in orchestras right now, there's you know kind of a, a crisis. I would argue a crisis happening because we have all these kids, and every orchestra is trying to figure out how to update. You know, update their this. You know, uh, talking about. Um, you know, ring cycle and doing nine hour operas and nobody gives a shit anymore. You know what I mean? You know, that kind of stuff, you know, and, and, and I'm making an opera example, right? But, right. but everybody's trying to, you know, make video game music that's, that's famous and we write it out for orchestra so all the kids can actually stay interested or whatever, you know? And so everybody's doing, I think everybody, and, and this is something that I, I can't say this for sure, but I think Kansas City in general has, in every single genre, has seemed like we wanted to stay tradition. Every kind of rock music I see is a ton of people playing classic rock stuff. Uh, I see a tons of bands playing classic rock. When you go to a jazz jam, everybody's playing standards, yeah. right? You go see blues, everybody's playing Muddy Waters and all this old stuff, yeah, right? right? Um, uh, and country stuff, I see a lot of people playing old country tunes, Merle Haggard, and... But when you go to New York, everybody's like, no, 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 yeah. And so what, how do, what do we do about this? About, about the idea of trying to, again, this is back to the order chaos kind of idea where right. how, do, how do we still keep our tradition and how do we keep, you know, it's a really deep question, but you know, no, it's, I, I, it's it's endless question, question, but how do, how do we keep all of this tradition but also realize that exactly what you guys are doing is sort of a, but you guys aren't from 1700s. You're from 20th, you know, 21st exactly. century. And so how, do you know what I'm trying to ask? Like I how, do, absolutely. What do you think about it's that? It's a constant razor's edge. And I could address what I do, and I can address what Kansas City does. Because kids don't give a crap about this. You know what I mean? It's not that they don't... You know what I'm saying. I'm not you know, sure like, kids give a crap about anything with their phones. Yeah, that's a good point. Sorry. Yeah. But there are. And you know what I'm saying? That to be insulting or whatever, no, but they, no, no. they don't care about all this old stuff that's tradition and so amazing and interesting. This, you know? this is the failure of... Our, I mean, this is a... We're in a crisis of society because of the dumbing down of society. Mm -hmm. And we've killed our education. We've killed our critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And people are acting very, very stupid. Yeah. So... So stupid in egregious ways that even talking about them not caring about history is like way down on the list. Right. But they, if you don't care about history, you don't know where you came from. Mm -hmm. And it's like improvisation. How are you going to do free improvisation if you don't have a vibe to come back to? You've mm -hmm. got to know where you came from, yeah. where you're going, or it's going to be chaos. And that's what we've got. I have always dealt with, and especially since I learned Celtic music uh, the last 40 years... Innovation, tradition. How do you get the two? Mm -hmm. I spent years to learn how to try to sound traditional. And in Turkish music and all that, I spent years in Turkey and, and, and studying that music. You know, days in the desert learning how to get that sound. And I can sound authentic. Mm -hmm. But I'll never be Turkish. I want right. to be Irish. Right. I mean, five generations removed, but... Mm -hmm. I want to have both the sound of being familiar with the old sound and I listen to I listen to Irish music and Turkish music from the 20s you know early recordings right. and that is one of my advice one of, a mm. piece of advice listen to the old guys yeah. always listen to the old stuff you know it, it, because today very little is handed down you can go to school now for Irish music you can I can go to school for Irish music I had to go there and learn it nobody uh, here knew yeah. it they, it's for, different for years they thought I was crazy to even do it we couldn't even get a gig. Now look at it, it's really popular here. Right. But I find that many people in sessions and in, in music, they don't want to hear about the history. They're not interested. And, and I will say that there's a kind of an indifference to my instrument because it's not recognized. Like the mandolins and the, right. the bazookis. You know, everybody wishes I'd play sittern like I used to. Well, I, I don't play sittern, I play this. Right. And there's a kind of an indifference, not to be mean, they just don't, they don't know it. It's not part of a, 
a new you that's understood and well, they, don't, they don't know what to do with you you know yeah, not okay. with you but, but with no they don't know what to do with me yeah no I, I that's absolutely true but but yeah. I, I, I'm not it's 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 normal but it's frustrating it's like yeah. Turlock Boylan told me the other day he says you know it takes time it takes time yeah. there was a time when the bazooki was not accepted yeah. in Irish music now it's everywhere but but I do feel as if you've got to get that place between I mean if you're going to be a singer songwriter and not pay attention to a tradition because it's not part of a tradition and write your own song, that's great. Or, or, or anyone who does that, you can get up and make music, but at some point you have to realize that you are part of a continuum. Mm -hmm. Even if you play rock and roll, that's now right. a tradition. Oh, yeah, yeah. And jazz players listen, listen to transcribed solos mm -hmm. of great players. Well, we've got to know where we came from mm -hmm. and we must study it. Even a lot of jazz players definitely understand the whole idea of, um, you know, some of the, the call and answer -y kind of stuff coming from sort of Africa, you Absolutely. know, originally, and then coming over to sort of the gospel church. Yep. But then, but that only leaves you at blues, right? And then they realize maybe in our understanding, you know, this, uh, the Creoles came over, but that apparently from what you're talking about came from really actually originally Spain of, of just the, the, the stringed instruments and all of this kind of theory knowledge and chords and all, do you know what I'm saying? Like they, they understand the melding of all of that crap. And now all of a sudden you get jazz and it didn't just all of the sudden happened in 1910 and people just got enlightened all of a sudden. There, there's this long history of, you know, long history of crap that this has all come through. I absolutely yeah. agree. I'd like to know, I have a question, yeah. and maybe somebody can write in and answer this, because this one thing I can't find, I'm tuning this because I want to show you a little chord thing. But, uh, where did... Okay, we know that in, in bluegrass, we've got solos that come in between the, the verses with the chord progression of the right. tune. Uh, I do that in Irish music, but that's not normally done. It, right. They just play the tune. Now, right. the improvisation in Irish music comes from subtle variations on the ornamentation. And the old guys really did this. Old Chief O'Neill, Sergeant O'Neill, who took down the for O'Neill's Irish music, he took down one guy. I, I'm not don't remember the name of him, but he played the tune. He says, that's not what you played yesterday. He said, that's the point, isn't it? So they were jamming. Mm -hmm, sure. And here's another thing. Why we call it jam? Jam, the word jam. Well, the scholarly definition of that is it comes from a kind of an off-color word that has to do with, you know, sex. <laughs> but actually... Jazz it up to turn this trick? Well, there's two things I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but this is supposed to be a serious show now, Rob. Uh, no, not necessarily. <laughs> That's what I like about but it. But they were talking about, you know, jazz it up there in the whorehouse, well, right? It, you know, it, jazz exactly. up the song sure. to, so, that, so that this lady can go up with the guy, get her money. You know, you know? these are secondary etymologies. Mm -hmm. What I think, first of all, jam, think about it. Where do they come from? The black culture of America and many, if not a majority of the enslaved people were Muslims. Mm -hmm. because they came from West Africa. A lot Africa. of slaves. Yeah. Yeah. And they, were, they were West Muslim. African. So the word in Arabic for both a mosque and a gathering is jami. Jam. Jami. Hmm. So these guys said, we're going to gather. It's a jam. I really believe that's the... Wow. I yeah, really I've never heard that before. Yeah, that's interesting. And get this. In the ninth century, there was a, an Arabic composition in Spain it was called, it was a syncopated composition, right? Called jazz. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I believe that this stuff comes from that and nobody's looking. And I can quote those sources. Mm -hmm. Well, jam is my theory. Yeah, jazz yeah. is, I can show you. Yeah, that's interesting. But, but I think that all of this came from this way. And I don't, I mean, surely somebody improvised and came up with ideas before the Arabs got there. And it's not cut and dried. Mm -hmm. And cats were traveling always. But something happened about that eight to 1100 mm -hmm. in Europe. Right. And it came from the, 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 the African people who were Muslim, who came up from West Africa and lived in, in Spain. There, there's the drum, right? All the rhythm, all the syncopation, and the bass line. And I'm sure a lot of that bass line came from there. So you got grounds. Then 
The chordal system that developed in Europe, actually, there's a couple of guys that say that the Arabs were doing that 200 years before, hmm. like in the 9, 10 hundred. These chords came about to give little progressions that people play. For instance, here's one that's real famous. I'm using gut strings. Okay. And I've got them pretty well under control. They're really well made Italian strings. And they're amazing sound. But yeah. what happens is, when it gets moist like we have now, when there's a weather change, yeah. it moves out. Yeah, sure. But they're pretty. Yeah. They're not in any way unusable or, you know, like yeah. to be afraid of. Yeah. Actually, nobody played on steel strings on fiddles until the last uh, 40 years. Yeah. You know, Casals. Um, Hyphen, all those guys, and Irish musicians. But so if you have this, check this out. Excited dance. Mm -hmm. That was one of the main jams, and they used from the Renaissance all the way up. Mm -hmm. uh, Beethoven, Beethoven improvised. Sure. Uh, yeah. All these guys. Uh, then you get things like this. Check this out. <laughs> Uh, G, Florence. you know, just that all of this stuff came from a whole bunch of crap before. Is that, is that kind of the point you're making? Exactly. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. check this all out. Support progression. This is are you It's real. The Scottish and Irish tunes, down to, what do we do with the drunken sailor? What do we do with the... It's, it's all the same Italian mm -hmm. progressions. Hmm. that were used in, in, in Scotland and Ireland. Yeah, yeah. And these progressions become, you know, for instance, uh, here's an Italian ground. What's that That's circle of fists? That's a da, million, da, 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 million da, da, tunes, yeah. Fly me to the moon. Right. It's amazing. All this stuff, Africa, yeah. Arabs, Middle East, through Spain, into Italy, all the way up. Mm -hmm. wow. into, that's interesting. And when it got to the New World, it encountered the enslaved blacks again, who brought the rhythm to it again. Because mm. you know that old time music, that syncopation comes yeah. from the, 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 the African-American cats mm. playing their rhythm. Yeah. And that brought it back with the banjo, which mm -hmm. came from Africa. It's all deeply connected. And that is what I really love, and what the music that I play, I want to reflect. Why we say jamboroke, which... The, it's play on jamboree, sure. which they think is African origin too, and I think probably Arabic as well, because Arabic's all over Africa. So we call sure. it jamboroke, and baroque means uh, a pearl that is beautiful but un but unusual. Mm. And what whatever that meant, they mm. didn't call it baroque music in the day. They called it new music, yeah. nuevo music. Yeah, and it started about sixteen hundred. And it what it did, it went from the old Renaissance, you know, like part music sprung out, you know, all the mm -hmm. four parts. It went back to a single line that had a cat playing the bass and a soloist going over it, whether it was a singer or instrumentalist, and everybody was improvising their parts. Mm -hmm. So what I really... And Celtic music is a direct descendant of that. It really is Baroque music. It's not ancient, ancient Celtic. I mean, the reels and jigs aren't. Yeah. Maybe some of the airs, but 
It's Baroque music. Yeah. And all of this is a form, what I play is a form of 17th century jazz that's informed that's cool. by world cultures all over and the creative spirit. So what I'm doing is taking a balance. Between, we aren't playing just ancient music. We're using historical aspects and being, I'm not going to be so historical that I'm going to give up some innovation that's going to help me, but I, I play an original bow. My frets are synthetic, but I'll tear them up if I'm not. But <clears throat> it's, it's pretty original. Oh, there are people that hate that. Mm -hmm. In early music, if you're not wearing burlap in underwear, <laughs> I'm not yeah. a reenactor. Right. I am a creative musician who is informed by history and inspired by history. Trying as good as you can with all of that stuff. You know which, what I mean? Which you know? goes back to your wonderful idea of trying to balance innovation and tradition. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do. But I do feel in Kansas City that we need that, that innovation. It's a wonderful music town. I do think, and you know, I don't want to... I'm, I don't want to criticize anything about our music here because we've struggled so hard to get where we are. And it's a marvelous music center and growing. Yeah, and there's is. some beautiful people. But I do have to say, in answer to what you said, I think that there is a reliance to some degree on what has gone before. Mm -hmm. And you can show that by how many innovators have come out of this town. Mm -hmm. We've got Pat, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and a few others, but... Uh, and I hope I'm included in, in that as an innovator, but mm -hmm. basically sometimes we look to elsewhere first for creativity. Right. And again, I don't want to take... Well, I would say, I, I what I would say to that is I, I totally agree with that. Uh, what I would say is that looking at the, the landscape of like, just take jazz, for example, um, there's a whole lot of two million person towns in this sit in this uh, country yeah. that don't have the jazz scene that we do, and there's exactly. and and I don't think you know obviously I wish it was everywhere, but but uh, but I I like that there's at least and that that's the word that I'm gonna say is that at least word somewhere is still doing traditional. You know, I love and, and maybe maybe that's we we would it's like we would it would be nice to add in this town to add some more, but I think there's something kind of cool that new, some place like a New York is about new 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 you sometimes. know, and sometimes and not always but New but York here, can be very 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 reliant too. These that's days. true. Yeah, that's you know, true. Right. And but but I I would say that that's one of the things that I think is cool about Kansas City is that it is it's somewhere. Somewhere that's still doing some of the tradition, but uh, but I, I agree with you that I think the scene in general can sometimes get a little stuck. Um, we do oh. that at, at jazz jams. That happens a lot. Is we accidentally always do standards accidentally. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean. And it's yeah. just standard, 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 and that's accidentally it. I think partly you know? that's because that's what people can play. That's the same thing right. in Irish music. Yeah. Everybody plays a small repertoire of tunes because yeah. that's what people know. And but, then they get complacent with that, and then, you know that's the pro the complacency problem is. The, but they have to, you know, they need something right, to play, and right. so I want to be gentle on it. I'm not going to say yeah, 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 because <clears throat> as I said, we have worked so hard to make this city what it is, and it's marvelous. There's people in New York that some say you guys have a lot. The problem is also that if people want to work in right. this town, right. we don't have Carnegie Hall, we don't yeah, have yeah. you know we have a few theaters, but we've right. got places that. At some point, you've got to play things that the people are going to, to come yeah. to. I've been very lucky. I put on my own shows half the time because I didn't want to be beholden to anyone's idea of what we should do. I do what I want. I do only what I want. Yeah. That doesn't mean I don't think about my audience because we play Beatles songs and yeah. I love doing it. Now, the problem with that is our biggest show of the year is our Beatles yeah. thing, you know, and I want people to come and hear, right. hear us play... Uh, Gallarda Napoletana mm -hmm. as well, and we play Mac the Knife. We play, yeah, yeah. we play Calypso. We play everything we can on here. But I mean, Viola da Gamba pops concert. <laughs> in a know, way, I mean that's kind of in a way. Of, in that a way. that was my question, or that was my comment about the symphony stuff. Is that that's what they're that's their well, they that's to. what they're doing now? Is they're just going? Oh, right. If if they want to come hear us do. E.T. and all this, you know, or whatever, you know, Beatles night or whatever, then, oh, okay. But I mean, you look know. look at a guy like Rod Fleeman mm -hmm. or Bob Bowman mm -hmm. or Bill Dye, amazingly talented technique and innovators, yeah. brilliant players who 
I could say for all of those guys, none of those guys, they work, but none of those guys get their due fully, you know, right. and, and almost nobody here really. And it's not always somebody's fault because there's also good new music writers. People are trying to write about music. KC Studio. Uh, uh, I've had several wonderful, I used to think, why didn't anybody ask me to talk? You know, you come and ask me to talk and uh, other people, you know, uh, uh, they're wonderful writers about music now. And I think everybody's trying. So I'm not going to be really hard on yeah, it because, you. you know, this isn't Kansas City of the 30s, you know, whorehouses and Pendergast and speakeasies. <laughs> You know, and that's what made it happen. That's what made yeah. it happen was the was the was the the crime. <laughs> right. But but it's still a pretty good time because at least I can have a bass here, B A S E. Yeah. And I can play what I want and introduce people to it. And no, we're we're not going to get rich, but we play. Yeah. And my musicians get paid. Yeah. And our audiences enjoy it and love it, and we love them. So I'm going to be real positive about that yeah, and yeah, only yeah. say let's. Let's all try to open our eyes. I listen to everything. Yeah. And we've got that at our fingertips now with all this internet stuff. Yeah. You know, and just listen. Yeah. Well, um, we're way past an hour already. Um, uh oh. So uh, uh, tell them your band name one more time. Yes. Gerald Trimble and Jam Baroque playing original instruments. We say connecting cultures through the ages on rare and historic instruments. And I hope we can provide an inspiration to other musicians and encourage and I'm always here to talk and play and share with people because I know what it's like not to be encouraged sometimes too to, mm -hmm. to fight an uphill battle to create we, we started Irish music here in 1970s you know mm -hmm. and there was a time when people weren't interested and now look so I'm always interested in encouraging others and hope to be approachable and open to that mm -hmm. because awesome, I've been man. very lucky and awesome. I think it's marvelous what you do. Thanks. By the way, he's a really good musician, too. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, Joe Tremble. Rob Foster. Thanks All for coming. Us. We appreciate you very much. All right. Get out of here. See you later. Bye now.